Okay, so <clears throat> one of the first things that you need to consider when you're designing for the web is that in some respects your design has to be flexible. Um, it's not like print. When you work and you design for print, you want the best quality image. So that typically means you're going to have a high resolution image. It'll be 200, 300 pixels per inch. You're not concerned about file size. I mean, you are, if you, know, if you have a limited storage space or whatever, but you want the best quality possible. Because once it's printed, that's your final product. It's done. You can print as many as you want. You can print them on whatever kind of paper you want. You can print them on fabric. You can do however you want to do it, and you hand it out to someone, and that's your finished product. When you're designing for the web and you're going to integrate images, it's a different animal altogether. Um, you're designing in, mon within, in keeping in mind that this is going to be viewed principally on a monitor. Okay? It's not going to be viewed for print. So that changes the resolution right there. Instead of a high resolution image, number one, we're going to design for monitor or screen resolution, which is the minimum resolution. That's 72 pixels per inch. Okay, so everything we do in this class, all images Okay, will be 72 pixels per inch. Okay. Now, 72 pixels per inch is the screen resolution of a Macintosh computer. Screen resolution for a PC is 96 pixels per inch. Why is it different? I don't know, but it is. So you'll notice the same image oftentimes on either platform and they will shrink and expand okay, a little bit. They won't appear the same size. But for our purposes, this, the lowest common denominator will work, work best. <coughs> the next thing that we have to consider is what format is, will work on the web. And there are only three different file types that you can use on the web. Now, for us, all of your original files, and I think this works best, will be Photoshop files. Because in Photoshop, you can have editable text. In Photoshop, you can apply filters. In Photoshop, you can have masks. You can have adjustment layers. You can do all sorts of things. Uh, so as long as your original, your original file is a .psd file, <coughs> you'll be in good shape. Because that's, as far as I know, the only file format that allows you to retain layers, to retain all of those effects and editable features that I just mentioned. Okay? But this doesn't work on the web. <coughs> you cannot take the file and, and, and throw it up on the web and expect it to work. It just doesn't work. <clears throat> there are only three file formats. So for the web, <coughs> um, file formats will be the following. You'll use JPEG, .jpg, or it's also .jpeg, right? Um, I don't know which is the best. It just it depends on what you're doing. This is fine. The other one will be a, uh, an old one, which is a GIF or GIF, G-I-F. And the third one, which is a newer one, is PNG. .png. Don't ask me what these acronyms stand for. I, I mean, I've been told time and time again over the years, and I can't remember. It doesn't matter. <coughs> but these are the three file formats. These are the only three file formats that can be used. No others. So what we're going to focus on today is how do you take your images, reduce them if they're a higher resolution to 72 pixels per inch in Photoshop, 
And then once they're 72 pixels per inch, we're going to convert them into one of these three file formats, which will compress them further so that they're compatible for the web. Each of these three file formats are compressed file formats. They shrink it down <coughs> even further because one of the things that you want to consider, or there's two things that you want to consider when you're developing images of any kind for the web or developing your web pages, is that you want the best looking image possible, but you also want it to download quickly. How, you know, how frustrating is that when you go to a website and you can see that an image is there, there's a little indication that there's something that's going to be there, but it takes forever for that thing to load. That's really annoying. <coughs> and in this day and age, we're, you know, all of us are very impatient, right? <coughs> and if it takes too long, you're on to another website very quickly. And for those of you who are photographers or your designers or your artists, and you want to have a presence online and you want to have your portfolio online, it will be really important to make sure that all of your images are integrated for the, for the web properly so that it gives the user experience a good one. So consider some other factors that determine what the user's experience will be. Can anybody think one, one important, I mean, there are many important things, but what, thing, what comes to mind? Um, let's say that there are, there are everybody in this class right now all has Macintosh computers. They're all about the same computer, same monitor size and everything. Um, what would be the determining factor that would, you know, if each of you had the same computer, but you each had one at your house, so that we have almost 30 different homes here, that would be um, the determining factor as to how quickly you receive <coughs> the pages, how quickly they download. What would that be? Internet. That's right. So that's going to be another factor. Now, you can't control that. Everybody has a different connection. And even if you have a fast connection, as we ex some of us experienced earlier this morning, depending on whether or not it's functioning properly or how many people are using up bandwidth, um, it can fluctuate. It's, you know, think of it like water. You know, I mean, if a lot, you know, when you try to take a shower sometimes at home, um, you, if you take it at a certain time of day, um, oftentimes the water pressure won't be the same because everybody else is getting up at the same time in your neighborhood and it's taking up water pressure. You know, it's not quite the same. It's the same. Same, I don't know that it's necessarily the same principle, but it's, it's sort of the same deal. It feels the same. So <coughs> you have to know who your audience is. That's the best thing. Um, you know, in, in all, all situations, um, know who you're trying to communicate. So, you know, who is your audience? That's really a big uh, major factor. So <coughs> if you're designing a website that you want to be accessible to everyone, then you're probably going to design for the lowest common denominator. You're going to make sure that the website is accessible and the image loads quickly for someone with maybe a 56K modem. Anybody still have a dial-up modem? Okay, well, there are people who do. And actually, the majority of people in the United States still do. But I'll bet most of you either have cable or DSL, right? And that's, that's you know, significant change. And that if will, will improve your, your um, experience, I guess. It will make it much better. <coughs> I don't think anybody misses waiting, 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 you know, for things to download. Okay, so <coughs> if... <coughs> For example, <coughs> you, your website is, is directed at the other end of the spectrum. For only art directors, then you might consider something different. You know, that number one, they probably all have minimum DSL or cable connection. 
maybe T1 connection. So those are really fast. <coughs> and then in addition to that, they probably have fast computers. They probably have large monitors. So you can gauge your page size. You can gauge, gauge the size of your images for that particular audience, that really limited audience. Now, other people can view it too, but it's certainly not going to be the same experience. It's going to be a horrible one. You know, if you have a 56K modem and you've designed your, <coughs> and you have a tiny little monitor and you've designed it for a large monitor and a fast connection, the, the experience is going to be very different. So, but if you don't care about those people, then so what? But it's something you always have to take into consideration. So we want the best quality image <coughs> and to download it as fast as it can. Okay? So what, you know, which of these images to, do we use, or which of these file formats do we use? Um, they're basically two different kinds. They're lossy and lossless. JPEG is a lossy file format. Everybody know that? Or do, have you heard about that before? L-O-S-S-Y and L-O-S-S-L-E-S-S. -S -S -S. <coughs> you never JPEG a JPEG. Meaning when you open up a JPEG and then you save it again as a JPEG and you open up a JPEG and you save it as a JPEG, over a period of time there will be a degradation in quality of that image. Because it's a compressed file format and you may have noticed that when you've saved an image as a JPEG, it will give you an option. Do you want high, medium, low, you know, quality? Well, high quality means that there's less compression. Low quality means that there's high compression. In order for it to compress, decompress, that's the codec, <coughs> what it has to do is throw away data. That's what I mean by lossy. So every time you open and you save and you open and save, you're gradually throwing data away. That's why I want you to start with an original Photoshop file, and any time you make changes, you make changes to the Photoshop file and resave it, those changes as a JPEG. Okay. On the other hand, these are lost less files. There's less compression, <coughs> so you can't make them as small as a JPEG, but they do not throw away data. Okay. But more to the point, I mean, loss, less, lossy is it's nice to know, but when do you use each of these? And there's some basic rules to follow. They are not chiseled in stone. It's not something that you will always do, but when in doubt, it's a rule, there are rules to fall back on. So if you have a photograph, a photo, or you have an image with tonal you know, significant tonal changes over, you know, gradations, that sort of thing, then probably a, a JPEG would be what you want to use. Okay? An illustration, a photograph, something where there's lots of tonal changes. Is that clear to everybody? If it's not clear, you need to speak up. <coughs> That's a simple rule. If you have a 2D flat image with solid blocks of color, like type, type by itself is just black and white, or it's a color in something else. So 2D, which, and when I say 3D in here, it's a, it's a, I'm thinking of tonal changes. So 2D slash flat graphics. no tonal changes, then you're probably going to want to use a GIF. Okay? That will probably work just fine for you. Or GIF. I guess it's supposed to be GIF like giraffe, but it doesn't matter. People say it both ways. <coughs> now, ping is more recent, so this will work for either this or this but the file size will tend to be a little bit larger. 
Um, older browsers do not support the ping file format, so that's something to consider too. So when you go to 4.0, I guess it might be 4.0, Internet Explorer or something like that, it, it won't, will not support the ping file format. When you're going to want to use either GIF or ping, mostly, or if you have any parts of your image that are transparent. So th these two file formats support transparency and JPEG does not. So if I have an image that's 100% or parts of it that are 100% transparent, okay, because GIF only supports 100% transparency, then I would want to use a GIF. So if I want to if I want to eliminate the background of an image and I only want the silhouette of my type or I only want the silhouette of a person and I don't want that the rest of the rectangular image to show through. Is that clear to everybody what I'm saying? Then you would have to use a GIF or a ping. Okay. So that's what makes these unique. That's when if I have a photograph or I have an illustration that has tonal gradations, but I want to, for example, drop out the background, then I would no longer use a JPEG, I would use a GIF or a PIN. <coughs> if I want partial transparency, meaning it's not 100% transparent, the background, but maybe I want my parts of my image or my entire image to be 50% transparent, where it's I won't say translucent, but you can see through it like a veil. Then I would have to rely on pings. So partial transparency would be ping only. Okay, so right there. You know, lots of rules to remember just for saving. That's just, we haven't even designed any page yet. We're just saving our images for the web. And you have to remember that. Yes? Would it be a requirement to go um, the tonal and the vector files that are combined? Okay, if it's a vector <coughs> for the web, it has to be converted to raster or bitmap. Unless you have that file in Flash, and Flash is all of the graphics in that are vector with the exception of a photograph, which are not. So that it combines. Flash does combine both. And then that would be <coughs> an SWF file, Shockwave Flash file. Or can you import that file in Photoshop? Shockwave Flash, you can. Photoshop but you wouldn't S want it, but you wouldn't want to convert it as an, you wouldn't want to take a still image and convert it to an SWF file and import it. It wouldn't make sense because the end user has, see now it gets into another issue. The, uh, in order for the end user to, to view that SWF file, they have to have um, the Flash plugin or player. Yeah. And on, yeah, on the iPhone, it, you can't play Flash. So all of your images wouldn't be readable. It wouldn't be view, it, you couldn't view them on on an iPhone. <coughs> so again, it, you know, it, it points to you know making sure that this is accessible to everybody. In fact, some of the earliest, another thing that I don't know that people do too much anymore, but you can still build it in Photoshop is if you want simple animations um, that are accessible to everyone and you don't need any kind of um, plug-in as you do with, with Flash would be to create animated GIFs. But they're kind of clunky. The animation is not smooth and the file size by comparison to Flash is considerably larger. So I don't even cover that anymore. Um, but you can, and if you want, want to, I mean, you can learn how to do that in, in Photoshop. You can create animated GIFs. Okay. So 
So I don't know if that answers your question. Is, can you think of a specific kind of file that has both, or if it's something that you, you created in Illustrator? If you, create, if you created a 2D image in Illustrator, you would still have to convert it to a JPEG, a GIF, or a PNG in order, in order to make it visible or to view it on, on a website. If I had to import an image from Photoshop, would that work? Well, you can, you can open files directly, you can open Illustrator files directly in Photoshop and when you do so, it will prompt you and it'll ask you what resolution do you want it to convert it to. And then when it does so, it rasterizes everything. It converts it to a bitmap. When I talk about rasterization or I talk about, um, when we talk about vectors, does everybody understand the difference yeah. or not? Who does not? Who doesn't? Okay. Photoshop is a bitmap. Well, might be easier to demonstrate it when we get to it. But briefly, um, bitmap or raster programs, or when you think of a map, think of pixels. Think of your image constructed of, of individual little picture elements. That's what a pixel is. So when you look at a picture element that's 72 pixels per inch, when you zoom in, you're going to see in one linear inch, you're going to see 72 pixels. And for high resolution images in that one inch, you're going to see they're smaller pixels now, they're 300 pixels per inch. So it's like a little, it's like needle point. You know, it's in each individual square, a gestalt, when you look at the overall, the, the, it's, the end result is greater than just the sum of the parts. You know, I mean, you, you can look at each individual pixel, but it, in overall, it becomes a picture. With vector programs or vector graphics, and Illustrator is a good example of that, all of the images that you create, or I and mean, that's a general rule now, but most of the things that you create in that are defined by mathematics. Every little object you make is a, or every little thing that you create is a separate little entity, a little object. If you make a circle, that's an object. If you make a little square, that's an object. If you have some type, that's a separate object. And all these objects are defined by mathematics. They're not, and what you can do is with that mathematics, you can scale them infinitely because it's a mathematical formula that's defining them. But when you've looked at um, raster, or bitmap graphics, when you zoom in or you scale it, you begin to see those little pixels because they just get bigger. That's why you're also told, and at least I tell my people in my Photoshop class, although things are changing a bit, that once you've scanned an image for a particular size, and then if you need it much bigger later on, you can't do that because it'll get blurry, you'll see it pixelized, and it just doesn't work. So that's the difference. So when you're working with vector graphics, in order to view those vectors on a website, just as a, as a still image, it has to be converted to one of these three file formats. You can't leave it as an AI file, which is Adobe Illustrator. But having said that, then when you work in Flash, that's different because you can export those files as SWF files, and they can be imported into Flash, and they can remain in vector because Flash combines both. But when, you know, so lots of different file formats to think about. Okay, so this is, this is not the fun part, but it is something you do have to pay close attention to. And the only time way I've known that you don't have to pay attention to this is that when you use a program like iWeb. <coughs> iWeb takes all of this and you don't have to think about this at all. Because when you integrate the photographs um, to your web page from into iWeb, um, from maybe your iPhoto account, your iPhoto can have has it creates both. It creates a thumbnail, and it also has the original file, which could be a raw file format. It could be, um, you know, a high resolution image. And then when you drag that image over into iWeb and you bring it onto your web page, it automatically converts it to the appropriate file format and it makes a low res image. 
You don't think it did that properly? Huh? Yeah, maybe the original. Oh, okay. Well, the newer ones, I think they've integrated that feature into it because they've made a lot of changes of uh, recent. And they're, it's becoming a really very useful program. I thought it was kind of interesting at first, but it's becoming pretty, I think, more and more useful than I ever imagined. So that's what we have to start with because you're going to have to, and then later on if you have video, you know, that would be another issue. And when we have sound, that would be another issue. How do you, you know, how do you get those files and prepare them and bring them in to the web? You know. So I'm going to try to. It depends on how quickly everybody. I mean, we will briefly, but hopefully, in the, the quicker we move, then and everybody is up to speed, then the more I can cover. But if everybody drags their heels and is slow to getting things done, then it's hard to, to do that. But yeah, I would like to. Because especially with Flash, Flash has integrated video of uh, recent very well. Really, really well. And you can also integrate sound with Flash quite nicely too because it takes, you can take WAV files or AIF files, which are the two file formats that are commonly used for um, sound for either PC or Mac, <coughs> and you bring them into, import them into Flash, Flash converts them to MP3 files, which are the kind of generic, you know, file formats that everybody uses now for sound. And then you can integrate that, that Flash file into your website, and you have sound on your website, and it's pretty cool. But, um, you know, more about that later. Sound and animation, if you're not careful, can be really annoying on websites. Really, really annoying. So I, I try to play it down a little bit because I had, I've had students where they have things bouncing and dancing all over the place and noise and it's, oh, it's like Vegas or something. It's horrible. You know. It's nice at first. It's fun, but then it gets annoying. That's the thing. Okie doke. So <coughs> if there aren't any questions about this, now I'm going to turn off the video, I'm going to redo it and turn off the lights and then I'm going to move on to Photoshop now. And I'll show you Photoshop, I think it was in 5.5 or something like that, <coughs> or whatever version, 5, 6, something like that, integrated some really nice tools for saving for the web. And they're really, really spectacular. Fireworks probably has more of the same, something that's similar, but they're, if you haven't used them before, I think they're really spectacular. They're really, really nice. And it makes it very easy to determine what file format you need and what degree of compression you need. And you can see, you know, make com on, the, on the fly comparisons quite nicely. So let me turn that off and let me um, rejigger this so that we can. Let's start again. Okay, so we're in Photoshop. I have <coughs> an image of a rubber ducky. Um, I need to know from all of you, how many of you have used Photoshop at least a little bit? Most of you. Okay, that's good. How many of you have not? Okay. Then pay close attention. <coughs> Some other issues that we need to deal with with regard to preparing images for the web. <coughs> now, when you look at the Photoshop file we have open, our ducky.tif, it, this gives us a lot of usable information without doing really anything. Number one, it tells it's a TIFF file. And I do what, know what that stands for, Tag Image File f Format. And this is generally used for print, okay? And ESP, encapsulated postscript files, were used for print as well. Um, but this is still a pretty common one that's used for print. Well, that won't help us for the web. Um, another important thing that it tells us too is that it's an RGB file, red, green, blue. That's um, what we need also for the web. CMYK won't work. Okay, uh, for those of you familiar with print, um, when you save your files, even if they're they're TIFF files or they're EPS, if it's going to be for print, you'll probably want to save them as 
is um, CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Those are the four colors that are used in printing. Um, and it's, they're basically, if you're not aware of it, that anything that you see in print by, um, by means of offset lithography is basically like a Seurat painting. Um, it's individual little dots juxtaposed next to one another, and your mind's eye mixes the colors. So if I put a blue dot next to a yellow dot, what do I see? I see green. My mind's eye mixes the colors. Okay? And here it, it's a little bit different. Okay? So at least we're already there. This is already RGB. It's 8-bit, which is good. And it's TIFF, but TIFF doesn't help me at all. So the first thing that I'm going to do, just to be on the safe side, is I'm going to save this on the desktop as a Photoshop file because I want that to be my original. And when I do File Save As, um, I need to, I'm just going to save it on the desktop because you don't need to save this at all. Okay. And I'll go ahead and I'll save it, not as a TIFF, but I'll save it as a Photoshop file. And you'll notice it automatically adds the extension .psd, and I save it, and I'm in good shape. Almost. Because one of the things that I'm going to have to talk about in a minute are naming conventions, which is another nuisance for the web. Because the way that this is named right now, even if this had the right extension, would be incorrect. Okay? So that's just another thing for you to think about. And I'll talk about that more in a couple of minutes. So, based on what I told you a moment ago, looking at this, just saving it this size and for the web, what kind of file format would I probably use? JPEG, right? Because it's a photograph. It has, there's tonal changes in here. Subtle shadows underneath the neck here on the body, tonal changes where there's indication of the wings, all sorts of tonal changes that make this look not 2D and flat, but three-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface. So there's a good chance that it's pro that will probably be saved as a JPEG, but I don't know that for sure. And if you don't know, if, you, if it's questionable for you, then Photoshop has the perfect tool for you. And that is when you go to File, Save for Web and Devices. That brings up an ancillary program. And you can look at it in the tabs at the top as Original, Optimized, 2-Up, or 4-Up. And I like the 4-Up. <coughs> now you'll look. You'll notice in the upper left-hand corner, it's always your Original. This is the PSD file that you're using to compare. Then we have a JPEG, and when I click on that, you'll notice it's JPEG high quality. And you'll notice it goes, in, if we look now in the, the bottom of each of these two, there's a little information about each of these. It says original ducky.psd, and the file size is 800K. Does everybody see that? Then we look to the one to the right, and it tells it's a JPEG. And it gives us information over here. It's a JPEG, high quality. You see where my mouse is pointing. It's a progressive file. Um, and it will be compressed to 33.6K. And it fit with a modem that's 56K, it will take seven seconds to download. So it gives us a lot of really useful information. Let's look in the lower left-hand corner and click on there. That tells us that it's medium quality. When I click on it, you'll notice it's highlighted in blue. And I look at this information window in the upper right-hand corner, and it tells me that this is a medium quality, and it's also progressive. And if I save it as medium quality, notice that it drops from 33.6K down to 13.5K, and it only takes three seconds to download with a 56.6K modem. That's a significant change going from seven seconds to three seconds. So which do you use? It really depends on you. That's what it allows you to look at these and compare. And my eyesight isn't so good. So for me, the medium quality one is just hunky-dory. 
that's fine. If I can get by with a medium one, why do I want a high quality? Then I've only used three seconds. So there is the comparison. There is the advantage to using something like this. <coughs> and then we go to the one in the lower right and we click on it and it tells us that's a low quality. And I do begin to see, I know on my monitor, I begin to see a degradation in quality. Um, I also notice that it also takes, it, it's a smaller file size than the medium quality. Um, it's only not, a little over 9 and 9K, but it still takes three seconds to download. So why would I want it when I can have a higher quality when it's going to take, take the same amount of time to download? So there's my comparison. Now what I can also do is I've decided <coughs> I want the medium quality. Let's come up here with a high quality. Instead of that, I'm going to try a ping 8-bit and see what happens. Oh my. If I use ping 8-bit restrictive or I try, let's say, perceptual. Perceptual is even better. It looks almost identical. It looks as good as the original. But then come down here and look at the file size and look at the time that it takes to download. It's 84K, that's worse than the JPEG was, and it takes over 16 seconds to download with a 56K modem. So I'm not going to use a ping. Let's look in the lower right hand corner, and I'm going to switch, and I'm going to switch from JPEG low to GIF. Now, GIF, it was selective or perceptual, either one, and there's there's more that, a lot more that I can talk about with regard to <coughs> perceptual, selective, adaptive, restrictive for web um, that I can go into, but I, I won't today. But look again, if I use perceptual for here, again, it's smaller than the ping, but it's way larger than the JPEG. So now I can make these, con I have to make these conscious comparisons and decide, you know what, the one for the web for me is the medium quality, the JPEG. I've made my decision. Now we're going through all the combinations now, but you know, after a while you'll get a pretty good feel. If you follow the basic principles that I outlined on the board a moment ago, you'll know intuitively. This is probably what it's going to be. And you can, but you won't know, do I need high quality, medium, low? You know, what can I get away with? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to save the medium. And when I click save, it prompts me. You'll notice it automatically saves and it changes the form, the, the extension to JPEG. That's what I want. But if I save it this way, it will not be compatible for the web. Not because it's not the right file format, it's because I have not used the right naming convention. So here's something more that you need to write down in your notes. When you name files for the web, it's my recommendation that you use all lowercase. If you want multiple words, put a space between, and you cannot use space between the words. You have to use an underscore, or in some cases a hyphen. I think underscore is the safest. So if I want yellow ducky, if that's what this is going to be, I would type in yellow underscore ducky. <coughs> you cannot leave a space between them. It will not work. You cannot start, if, if you want to just join them together like that with no space, that's okay too. Do not start it with a numeral. You can end it with a numeral, meaning this is yellow ducky 2, but do not start it with a numeral. Do not start it with a capital letter. Do not use anywhere in here any special characters. Do not use something like an ampersand. Do not use anything like a um, question mark. Because these, for anybody who has written any code, have different meaning. There's different, you know, they are used in writing code, but the syntax it's used is different. 
So don't use, start with a lowercase. Do not use any spaces between words. Do not start with a numeral. Do not use any special characters. There are exceptions where if you want to use a capital letter, you can do something called camel casing. And so I've started with a lowercase y, and in the middle of my name, I have a capital D, and that helps in the readability of this. So I can read this as yellow ducky. And if I wanted it my yellow ducky, it could be my, and then I could go here, and this could be a capital Y, my yellow ducky. See how much easier it is to read that? That would be, that, con that naming convention is accept acceptable. This is really, really important that you get this right because especially later when we switch to Dreamweaver, <coughs> it's going to be especially important. Otherwise, you'll wonder why the images aren't uploading and why, they don't, why they're not visible on your page. It's because they're, the wrong they're not the wrong file format. You've used the wrong naming convention. So that becomes really, really important, really, really important. So that, unfortunately, therein lies another thing we have to take into consideration when we're designing for the web. Are we using the right file format? Are we saving it in the right, in the right file format and compressed properly? And are we using the not right or the correct naming convention for it to work? It's very picky, very, very picky. So now I can save this, boom. What I like doing though, you'll notice that my original file format is still ducky.psd. I really like getting into the habit, even with my original file, of naming it in a convention that will be adapted to everything else so that, so that I don't have to think about that later on. Because every time I save this for the web now, I'm going to have to have to reconsider this and think about the naming, con naming convention. Okay, So one of the other, you know, using the same image and thinking about another file format, what if I decided that, you know what, I don't, because this will not only bring in the duck, it brings in the background. You only have rectangles. Well, what if I only wanted the duck and I wanted to eliminate the background? Okay, so that eliminates JPEG now. Now I only have GIF or ping that I need, that I can use, correct? So in my Photoshop file, <coughs> I'm gonna go to, he I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna double click on the layer to make this an editable layer. And I'll go ahead and I'm going to use a tool that's really nice. It's an eraser tool. And I'm going to use the magic eraser. Okay, magic eraser is kind of neat because what I can do is I can click on the background and voila, it eliminates that white background. It's gone. I can tell that I have a transparent background because of this checkerboard. The checkerboard does not print. It just tells me that that's, that's transparent. Okay, so now I'm ready to save this for the web because I've eliminated the background. Something that we should also look at too, and it did a pretty good job. There aren't any white pixels out here, any colored pixels, but there may be green pixels later on because of the green background that we had. We'll see in a moment. But I don't want to confuse you too much right now. Let me just let's just focus on the three separate ways that you would be saving. So, huh? Okay. Did you did you use the magic eraser to delete it? Okay. I have to. I had to double click on the layer to turn this into an editable layer. Then I used the magic eraser and I clicked on the background and that eliminated it. I don't want to labor, I mean, I'll talk later on after this is done more about Photoshop if you want to know how to use it. That's okay. I just want to 
to show you the examples, get it recorded, then I can turn off the recorder and then we'll go over those. So now I have a, I have a transparent background and now I'm ready to save for web. So I say save for web. And you'll notice that this is my original. It has a transparent background, but notice all the other samples that I had were JPEGs and they revert back to the white. Because with a JPEG, you cannot have a transparent background. So I know immediately I can either use um, a ping 8-bit, a ping 24. Instead of restrictive color, I'm going to use perceptual. So it gets close, but I still have the transparent background. I can come down here in the lower left-hand corner, and, and again, instead of JPEG, this time I'm going to select GIF. And I'm going to select Selective again, and that permits the transparent background um, once again. So I know that I cannot use a, a JPEG because it, it's going to, to, to leave the transparent background. Now I'm going to do a comparison between the ping 8-bit and the GIF. And you'll see that the GIF wins out slightly by a second. A little bit smaller file. It's still fairly large. It's 77.97K, almost 80, 80K, which is much bigger than what we had for the JPEG, which is down here, 20, 236 or 8K. Big difference. So, you know, I mean, do you want that transparency? You have to think about that. But that's the price you pay. So now I'm ready to save it. I'll select a GIF and I click Save. And again, I'm going to name it again, My Yellow Ducky or Duck, using the naming convention that we just talked about. And notice that automatically, since we had selected a GIF, it adds that GIF extension. So I can go ahead and click Save. And it doesn't interfere with my original file. It doesn't interfere with the JPEG that I saved. It's only adding a separate extension. And if we had these saved in the folder where we're supposed to be saving these, I mean, I noticed that I have Ducky Photo, you know, Photoshop, and I have my yellow Ducky GIF, and I have Ducky JPEG. If all of these were in a folder, let me go ahead and um, create a brand new folder here. So if you had all of these in your folder, and I opened up the folder. Notice that they're all right next to one another, and each one will have a different <coughs> extension. So I'm keeping them together, but I know that they're different, and each one has a different pur purpose, a different function. <coughs> so I'm going to revert back to my original with the white background, and because now what I want to do, or let's even leave it like this. I'm going to do one more thing to it. Maybe I don't want the duck to be um, completely opaque. Maybe I want it to be partially transparent. So I can come to my layer and I can change the opacity so that it's 50 percent opac there's 50 percent opacity here. okay? There's only one file format that will permit me to do that, and that would be the ping. So now I can once again go File, Save for Web and Devices. And this time I know I'm just going to jump directly to Ping. And I'm going to try the 8 for a second. 8-bit has less information here as opposed to 24. 15 seconds. And um, it keeps the transparency in there. Okay. If I want to bring the background back, I can. But you'll notice how different it looks with that transparency. Okay, if I select 24-bit, now notice what it does. 24-bit, if I select 8-bit, it just makes, it, it, the image itself is not, is no longer transparent, it just makes it lighter. If I actually want this transparent, notice that I can see that transparent grid through it. I have to use ping 24-bit. Now look at what I have. With a 56K modem, it's 47 seconds to download this. You really have to think twice about if you want to use that. It takes a long time. I don't think it's worthwhile. 
There was other workarounds. But if you're going to take this file and you plan on using it in the ping file, maybe using it in Flash, that's not a bad way because Flash is going to convert all of them to JPEGs anyway. Yeah, so you, don't, so you don't have to worry about it. No, you won't lose it because you can regain it in Flash. So that's, but I'm, I'm right now talking, if you take this image and you want to put it in your HTML page that you're going to open up in Dreamweaver and you're going to upload to the internet. <coughs> so now I'll save this one and I have it saved with all my other, my other duckies and I'll go ahead and this will be my yellow ducky and ping and I've saved the same image three different ways. <coughs> and each one has a distinctly different purpose. Is it a little overwhelming, a little confusing? Is it, I hope I'm making it clear. It's very important, number one, that you save in the right format, that you take into consideration file size, quality, and that when you do name it, that you use the proper naming convention. Otherwise, it will not work. It just won't work. It sounds trivial, and when I've watched all the lynda.com videos on web design and stuff and how to use Dreamweaver and everything, but they, they don't talk about it. It may be talked about in other tutorials, but if you're just watching Dreamweaver, they don't discuss it that much. So. It's my job since this, is, this class is web design as a whole that we start off with this so that you recognize that these are going to be issues that you're going to have to face throughout the semester. Okay. I don't know how much time I have left on my video recorder, but I think I've covered what I want to, and I'm going to upload that video <coughs> at the end of today, <coughs> and then it's time. Um, my voice is given out, I'm going to take a break and then we'll come back and I'm going to show you more things that will probably be more confusing for all of you. Um, I don't mean them to be.